Is it all good? So hello everyone, my name is Odilon, and today I would like to uh, present my vision of what Blender could be in the automotive industry. I say vision because uh, for now I'm still a student, but this is how I would like to use uh, Blender in my uh, future job. So a quick overview on the content, I will start with a quick intro and then uh, talk about how you can shape vehicles with Blender. Uh, how I moved then to use Blender as a data preparation tool in order to export stuff uh, to, in this case, Unreal Engine. Then Blender as a visualization tool with Eevee. And then I will talk about what I see coming next and finish it with a conclusion and the final process I ended up on. So is there anyone here using Blender to do vehicles? Not that much, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Um, basically, I do, and as I said, for now I'm still a student, but I would like in my future job, and what I'm studying right now is what they call digital design. So in the automotive industry, it means that you help someone to express his vision into something he can visualize, prototype, and then produce. So basically, it's uh, most of the time the link between the sketch part and the, the clay modeling part. But this is clearly not a defined process, and each company has a different process, which involves a lot of loops between Sketch and 3D and 3D and Clay. And so today we will talk about this virtual uh, creative phase. And uh, so to start with the beginning, um, I've been using Blender for nine years for now, and my first encounter with it was with the glorious uh, Blender 249B. And I couldn't get anything, any of the features. I was just struggling so much and playing with things I didn't understand at all. And my goal was to do cars. So I was putting a lot of effort in it, and it was really bad, really, really bad. And until I thought it was maybe the polygonal approach and Blender were not suitable to, to do cars because I couldn't get a nice reflection and details on surfaces. But still, one doubt was keeping me trying, and it was this guy with his Opel, and this was on the Blender official website, which means I would see it like almost every day. And I was really thinking that if this guy were, was able to do it, I just had to work harder, and so I continued to, to try a lot and to be more and more precise. And then I entered the design school, continued to use uh, Blender until I finally entered as an intern in digital modeling in Kiska. Uh, Kiska is a design studio in Austria who is responsible for KTM and Uzvana motorbikes. And they are like hardcore uh, blenderers, really. They, they script a lot of stuff and everything. And uh, they, told me how, they taught me how to use Blender in a much more professional way. And what I'm going to show you today is my evolution from last year uh, as using Blender only as a modeler. And to up to uh, using Blender as a Swiss Army knife I'll always, always carry with me for everything I do in every project. And I will start with Blender as a shaper. So this is, for me, the most common use uh, automotive companies could do of uh, Blender. But the thing is, for now, the main, the main tools are uh, NURBS and uh, most of the time LES uh, from Autodesk. But still, in some companies, they are switching to, to Polygonal and some as Tata, we talked about Kiska, but Tata as well, uh, are already using Blender. Uh, you can see two really nice talk of uh, Mathilde Amp and Pierre-Paul Andriani, who did Beacons in 2015 and 2016, if I remember, remember well. And so this is really encouraging. But what I think is really cool is to see that some designers are individually learning Blender, and basically they use it for a personal project, but then they bring it to the office and work with it. And this is the case of Sidney Hardy. He's doing crazy stuff with Blender, and uh, he, he's right now uh, in OD in California and using it also for uh, his work. And so what would a uh, process of creation of a vehicle, uh, what it would look like in Blender? For this, I will illustrate with a project I had to do with my friend Antoine de Salaberry for his diploma. And so, basically, it has nothing to do officially with uh, the North Face or anything. It's just his prospective vision of it. But basically, we would start on sketches, and he would bring this to me, and together we would create the basic volume. No sub, uh, subdivision surface or anything. 
just the, re the rough volume and defining the silhouette. And then based on that, I would take screenshots on which, on which he could define uh, the, the f next parts we would work on. And so back and forth like this. And for this, Blender is perfect since you have a non-destructive workflow and modifiers, which is great and which lets you go from the volume definition part to the more surfacing parts really easily. And you can just shut down the, the modifier to, to see what it gives in terms of just volume and then go back to surface. So it's really cool. And bit by bit, we were able to end up with a final model. But then um, this was kind of the let's make compromises uh, project because we had really short deadlines, so we had to go fast. And I wanted to train on something maybe more challenging in terms of uh, reflections and everything and see if I could find tools that could help me to do that. And that's why I modeled this existing concept car. Uh, it's the Genesis Essentia. It's a concept car I love. And so basically, the, the, the main process was the same, uh, rough volume definition, and then you end up with a final thing. But in between, uh, something changed, and it was the use of the shrink wrap. I guess you all know what the shrink wrap is, but uh, basically, it was really useful just taking the vertices I wanted to be affected, and it helped me make uh, door cuts and everything and prove my younger self I was completely wrong on the polygonal approach because you can clearly keep the reflection and still have a lot of details, which is really, really cool. But what also changed on this project for me is the scripting side of Blender, which I was completely new to. Um, and basically, the, I wanted to, to try it for years, but finally I did it. And my first exercise was to do this kind of menus. You can find them in uh, Autodesk LES. Uh, it's called Marking Menus, and basically it's just selection and modification tools, but accessible really fast. And Blender has Py menus, so I just uh, try to script uh, the same. I used to work with this in Kiska. They, they have it, but then when I left uh, at the end of my internship, I didn't have those menus, and so I did them again, and it changed clearly my, uh, my modeling life and I was able to get this, uh, this car at the end and to think about the, the next phase. And so uh, I had a friend at this time, he was doing an internship um, in a visualization company. And so we thought together, like, yeah, let's go uh, for, for a visualization proje project together. He's called Valentin Becker, by the way. And so we started to use uh, data, um, sorry, Blender as a data preparation tool. And first thing we, we ended up with when we started to import is the UV problems. And so two things appeared. First is that for some part, as this one, we want clean UVs. I know there is cuts, but it's normal, it's carbon fiber. Um, and, but we want clean UVs, not the auto, uh, auto unwrap. And basically, there is some stuff you want to do by end, but for most of the part, we didn't really care because we knew that we would never see these parts. And so just an automatic unwrap would do the job. And also, um, Unreal Engine asked for two channels, one for the texture and the other one for the light map. And this just sounded as really boring and repetitive tasks. So what I did was just another script, uh, which would help to just take an object, check if there is a channel one UV. If there is not, it means you don't really care of the, about the, the, the UV itself, so it project one for you and then it does the same for the channel two and rename the channels. It doesn't really, uh, it's not really useful to rename the channel, but I prefer to keep a clean file. And then for 70 objects, it was really better to have this and not make mistakes. And then we thought like, okay, let's go VR. Now, now we can import uh, data into Unreal Engine, but we already knew that we would have some limitations and by the fact it's not retracing, and mostly with reflection and shadows approximation. So we started to do bakes in Blender, and first things we did were, was to uh, bake a ground shadow so that the car is on the, on the ground. And then we thought, okay, maybe we can go a bit uh, further, and we didn't like the, the light on the tire, so we did a proxy, uh, which was just a simplified offset of the tire, on which we would bake um, an ambient occlusion, and the idea of having a proxy is that it would let us spin the wheel. Uh, we didn't do it on this project, but we were already thinking about it. And then we went more into cheating, and we knew that it was easy to reflect an HDRI on Unreal Engine, but it's way more difficult not to reflect it. So what we did is uh, using ambient occlusion as masks to say to kill the reflection or the, the specular on some parts. It, 
wouldn't bring more uh, realism, but just more contrast and would change the old stance of the, of the car itself. And we were doing fine with bakes, but then... Oh, no, sorry, I forgot to mention that we already did a script to, to do the bakes because uh, obviously it's all also boring to do bakes for each object. And so then uh, ray tracing appeared on uh, Unreal Engine, and we thought, like, okay, maybe it's a, it's a good opportunity and it's the next step into uh, automotive visualization. So we tried it, uh, but we also thought that it could change our ambition. And instead of just having a steel car on the ground, we would just animate it. But we were, like, completely new to animation. And so it was really, really bad at the beginning because basically we did, like, a whole rig. Uh, with just empties everywhere and constraints and everything. And we thought like, yeah, if it's moving in Blender, there is no way it wouldn't uh, move the exact same way in Unreal Engine. But it was completely uh, wrong. And it took us a lot of time to understand that the best thing was just to do one armature and not animate the armature itself, but the bones. And uh, yeah, we just did something simple with uh, one bone on each wheel, a driver which uh, is connected to the, the, the main bone, and then two bones for the steering and an empty in front of the car just to, to uh, drive the, the steering. And this is really simple, but we could go further and bring like um, suspension and everything. And something else appeared that we didn't expect, uh, which is the fact that you have only one object when you import it, when it's uh, parented to an armature. And basically it means that you have to shade every different component if you want to be able to shade them inside of Unreal Engine because, well, you have just one object. But this is easy, we just uh, did it in, in Blender, it was fine. Then we did a quick studio in Blender, and we were finally able to have fun with Unreal Engine and the real-time ray tracing. And I just want to credit um, uh, NF Studio for the, for the screens, because he did like crazy artworks that we took from his uh, Vimeo. And it really gives a, a good mood, uh, I think, uh, on the video. And it was really interesting to do this project, and we learned a lot. But we also understood that we were getting a bit uh, far from the creative process I described at the beginning, and this was not really suitable if you want to go fast. Like, you can be really efficient to present stuff with Unreal Engine, but sometimes you need to be more than fast. And um, this is when I started to use more Blender as a visualization tool. And so for this, I knew that I wanted to go experimental, and try some stuff, so I just did uh, a sandbox project, uh, which, was, which had two main focus. Uh, the first one was to use Elias for the modeling and not Blender, because it's easy to bring uh, s like mesh from Blender to Blender. It's really not a problem, but an industry standard is Elias, so I would use Elias just to try. But also to keep uh, an open window on the creation uh, phase and not fix thing by doing exports and to Unreal Engine, for example, in terms of animation and everything. And basically, the, in other words, this was just um, using Eevee. And so I started with those sketches and did the, the modeling on Elias, but I wanted for each of those steps to be able to visualize it in Eevee. And the big problem was the import part, because basically, uh, Elias is NURBS, and as you probably know, Blender and NURBS are not really friends. And so you have to tessellate it, but if you do it, you basically have two options. If you do it in LES, you take your group, you often work with group uh, of surfaces for each of your parts, then you have to stitch it, but the stitch will basically make one object uh, out of connected uh, surfaces, which means that if you have um, surfaces not connected, you will have two different shells, um, and they will be named shell blah blah blah. And then you have to tessellate it. This can be done easily during the export, but still you have to do it, and it makes a lot of steps uh, for each of your objects. But if you import straight away without stitching uh, in Blender, then you get this really bad outliner, because basically you have uh, one empty corresponding to your group with the name of your group, and inside you have all uh, your surfaces, which is really bad because in the viewport you just select uh, your object and you get one surface only. And it's really annoying to shade. So basically what I did was just um, doing another script which would uh, take each of the, of the empties, get all the surface parented, join them, rename them, and remove the empty. And this was uh, helping me because I could just import uh, each of my step 
in, my, um, in, in the evolution of the project really easily and really fast. And so I was able to, to visualize finally my model in Blender, but still I needed one thing to be able to get this, which is uh, materials. And I was kind of new to uh, Blender materials, so I started to build, um, this is the actual material shelf I have, and it's really new, so I have to bring a lot, of, a lot more, but the, the basic goal is to have something only procedural, from car paint to carbon and wood, but uh, I guess I won't be able to, to keep it procedural since for leather and stuff like this kind of pattern, it's really, really difficult, unless someone here has the solution I'm really interested in. Um, and the other goal was uh, to, to do something simple out of something way more complicated and bring this kind of tree into simple settings I could just tweak really quickly and not spend hours just to make the materials uh, for, the, for the visualization. And that was it. I was able to, to have this and use it uh, as underlay so that I could sketch on top and think about the lines I wanted to give and everything. And if I would have worked with a, a designer, transportation designer, it would have made really coolest thing, not just lines, but I'm sure he would prefer to work on the EV visualization rather than the LES uh, basic visualization one. But still, I wanted to go further with this, and I thought that if you have a review and you want to present your project, uh, maybe you don't want to get to the settings and the interface of Blender. And I also, it happened to me that I was just here to change a color, and the designer was like, yeah, a bit more blue, a bit more green. And I don't really like that. I prefer just someone to, to give his vision directly. So I did uh, just a small pie menu that would take the settings of your material, whatever the material is, and take the color on one side, take the slider uh, values on the other side, and a preview on top. And that way you can work uh, in full viewport and change your color easily, as well as uh, changing the material itself, because this is basically the, the visualization you have in the shading e shader editor. And if you want to do a full version, full carbon version, you can. And th this directly in the viewport. And so, yeah, at the end, I think EV is really playful and it can bring a lot in design reviews since you are able to show not only the, the project itself, but also you can better define your vision with an environment and everything if you want to play with it. So it's really cool. And this is straight out of EV. I don't like to do post production stuff, so this is just EV. And what I see coming next, well, there is some stuff I would love to see uh, implemented in Blender, like VR. I know there was something in the spotlight, but uh, and I followed uh, with a lot of interest the Google Summer of Code, but uh, like a dedicated VR part in Blender using EV would be just great and would uh, help not to use third-party um, softwares. That's, this is what we do for now, and sometimes it's really annoying. In the API, just having loading bars would be perfect because I always think that my computer will just burn when I try a script. And um, interactive mode, I heard some stuff about this, and this would be great for uh, design reviews just to be able to start some animation with keyboard events and to say, like, we open the doors, we close the doors, stuff like this, as well as an asset manager um, implemented on with which you could switch, like, environment and stuff. This would be really cool. But there is also existing tools that I have to try out, like Tissue that we saw this morning, and it's so impressive. I really have to try it out for like front grill and procedural uh, design, as well as Vershock. It's kind of the same idea of parametric things. And the conclusion is the process we ended up with my friend uh, Valentin, which is basically this, to go from an ID, model it, and then visualize it. And what I like about this is that if you remove alias, you basically have a completely free process um, for internal use. And so, at first there is the modeling part. A cool thing is that alias recently added a feature which just, just like polygonal, but uh, it translates it into uh, surfaces. And so, what is cool is that you can import low poly OBJ and then it will uh, translate it as surfaces so that you can do trims and fillets and every other thing you can do in NURB softwares. Uh, I didn't talk about HDRI mapping, but this is also a really, really cool thing you can do in Blender to create environments. Then you go to Blender just to, to bring all the, the things together. 
And then you have the, the visualization part, sorry, <laughs> uh, with Unreal for the VR and retraced experience, and when you have more time, and EV if you want just quick reviews on the go. And yeah, I think this it could be suitable for the, the work I'm going to do, and I will try to bring this uh, in my future job for sure. Because what I like uh, is, as you can see, Blender is, is at all step of this process, and it really brings a creative freedom that we don't have in other softwares. So thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, you can <laughs> drop an email. <laughs> and if you have more questions on the Unreal Engine part, you can ask to Valentin. Help yourself. Thank you. Thanks a lot.